Thank you very much for joining uh, this Landmark Chambers webinar on residential fire safety update. Uh, my name is Justin Bates. I'm chairing today and uh, I'm speaking uh, slightly later on. I'm joined today by my colleague Simon Allison, who will be speaking first. I'll do the housekeeping now while we uh, wait for everyone to come in. Uh, as I mentioned uh, just a moment ago for those who joined uh, earlier, we've got about 450, 460 people joining today, so it's taking a little bit of time to let everyone into this meeting. Um, so I'll do the housekeeping first. All of your microphones are automatically muted, so you don't need to adjust your settings on your computer. Um, Simon and I are very keen to have questions throughout this session. Um, we'll probably try and answer them towards the end, but the best way to get a question uh, to us is in the Q&A box. It should be in the uh, probably in the bottom of your screen if you've got the same one as me. So uh, open up that, type in your question, and we'll try and pick them up towards the end. We'll try and answer as many as we can, um, but times are a little bit tight today for reasons I'll come back on to. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, and after we've finished it, you will receive a link to the presentation and a recording uh, shortly. If for any reason you lose connection during the webinar, you can rejoin just by clicking on the original link, uh, and that should all work. Um, so let's start then by, uh, by introducing uh, there you are, the two speakers. You've got me there back in the days when I had more hair before the start of lockdown. And you'll be hearing from me shortly talking about legislative reform. I'll be talking about the draft building safety bill and the reaction to that, and then the fire safety bill and, the, and some of the proposals in that. And before that, you'll have my colleague Simon Allison, who has precisely as much hair as still as he did in that photo. Um, he'll be talking about the building safety fund, where it's got to, and some of the issues with it. We've got between us, we've got, we've got about 15-20 minutes each to talk on our sessions to allow a little bit of time for questions at the end. We need to be quite strict with time because Simon has to go to court at 11.45. He has to go to a real, actual, in-person, physical court, um, which I think is something we all used to do once upon a time, but uh, I can't really remember it now. Um, we, we kind of undenied about where to pitch this seminar because there's, there's, a, there's so much you could cover. And there's so many different layers of detail you could go into. Um, we've ended up doing this at a relatively high level, flagging up some of what we think the key problems and key issues are, because we could do a whole hour on just, for example, Section 20 consultation issues in relation to fire safety works. So if this ends up being a little bit too high level for you, I'm sorry, but we're happy to talk about things in more detail uh, um, later on. Um, or you can always instruct us, which is always a nice thing to do. Uh, the, the the things we're not talking about in this in this seminar are also just as important as the things we are. So we're not going to talk about the EWS one changes, for example, um, because again, that would just that would uh, take us down a route and eat up a lot of time that we don't really have. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to Simon to talk about the current state of play with the Building Safety Fund, and uh, I'll see you in about fifteen twenty minutes. Thanks, Justin, and uh, good morning, everyone. So, um, as Justin says, there's quite a lot of uh, potential to cover here, uh, all in a short period of time. So this is what I'm going to attempt to rattle through in about 15 minutes. Uh, very quickly, what it is, because I'm sure uh, most of you are, are pretty familiar with that. Eligibility requirements, and then we're gonna look at sort of the current timeline where we are, uh, and then come on to some of the difficulties that are arising um some possible changes uh, and some sort of practical points that uh seem to be arising in quite a few of the cases that uh certainly i've been looking at so what is it uh there there's your link to the sort of central um sort of government source of information um a lot of what i'm going to tell you in this sort of first couple of slides you can find on there but you've got on there all the sort of prospectus information state aid information technical guidance so on and so forth what you won't find there is uh, things like the funding agreements, that sort of thing, but there's there's plenty to be getting on with. Uh, it's also important that we distinguish this from the ACM fund. Um, I'm sure you'll all recall that ACM is the type of cladding that was on uh, the Grenfell Tower that was prioritized at the start with a, um, I think it was a 600 million pound uh, private sector fund uh, and separate arrangements in the social sector. That of course led to uh, calls perfectly reasonably for people in blocks with other types of combustible cladding saying, well, what about us? And there's some very effective campaigning and that led to this 
uh, building safety fund is one billion pounds to be spent in the current tax year 2021 so buildings over 18 meters i'll come back to that and it's, it's where you've got things like hpl high pressure laminate and um polystyrene type sort of cladding uh, and uh, other types of combustible insulation. It covers public and uh, private sector. And uh, what's been clear from the outset is that the one billion pounds is uh, nowhere near enough. I mean, I, I've seen various estimates that they're really just guesstimates that the, the true cost is going to be somewhere between five billion. I've even seen figures up to 30 billion if one takes into account buildings that are under 18 meters as well so uh, it, it's it's pretty clear i think that it's not going to be enough who makes an application well the applications and registrations were to be made by building owners or responsible entities so it might be an rmc or an rtm company or, or the freeholder but it's not it's not done by leaseholders so what were the eligibility or what are the eligibility requirements uh, in terms of height, uh, we're talking when we're talking about the 18 meter rule. In fact, it's 17.7 meters because they're allowing a 30 centimeter tolerance. We're talking about the height from the top story, uh, so the floor, the top story of the block, down to the highest point of ground level. Um, and quite a few applications, I understand, have been knocked out just by virtue of the block not meeting that requirement. Next, all of the works that you're seeking funding for must be recoverable under the service charge uh, from leaseholders. So if you've got a block where, uh, you know, there's a poorly drawn repairing covenant and nothing else in there, such as sort of costs of statutory compliance, uh, if you wouldn't be able to recover from the leaseholders as a service charge, that's it, you're wiped out from the funding. That's because this is to um, support leaseholders, not building owners. One of the more controversial requirements is that the works uh, must not have been committed to when the uh, when the fund was announced. Uh, so it's works that had commenced or been committed to on the 11th of March. If, if, you, if you were in that position on the 11th of March, you can't get any funding, which seems horribly unfair, frankly, because all the people who did the right thing, as the government called it, and, and got the works underway quickly are effectively finding their leaseholders penalised by not uh, having access to this funding. There has been a challenge to that decision. Uh, it hasn't succeeded um, and it is what it is. Uh, mixed use blocks, fine, but non-resi isn't. So hotels aren't covered, uh, hospitals aren't covered. You're gonna need lots and lots of information, uh, lots of evidence. So you're gonna need copies of leases, state aid declaration forms, information proving the height of the building, evidence of the materials in use. You're probably going to need intrusive surveys, um, and you're going to ultimately need a scheme of works and, and evidence of a, a tender exercise. And there's a deadline of the, at the moment of the 31st of December by which all that information, including the costed tenders, needs to be provided. Uh, and the last thing of note is, of course, you've got to pursue any third parties. So you have to take reasonable steps to pursue anyone else who might be liable. And any sums that you come on to recover in due course, you have to repay to MHCLG, that's less your irrecoverable costs. So where are we? Well, uh, registration opened early June, closed 31st of July, applications open from the 1st of August. And they're being dealt with on a first come first served basis. Uh, it's not wholly clear how that's administratively being done. Um, I assume it's partly the application date and the sooner you have sufficient information in place to be invited to make an application, the sooner you'll get that in. And then one assumes that then you have to make your way through the various validation stages um, so that then MHC can make a decision and it's at that point it's first come first served. The validation process has been done by uh, Homes England or the GLA for uh, London properties and then they pass it back to MHCLG who make the ultimate decision based on the validation information. It's previously a slow process. Uh, I think probably that's partly because there's lots of inquiries having to go back to applicants saying what about this, what about that. Partly just because of the volume of applications uh, and then I think frankly uh, it's been pretty slow in many instances simply because applicants haven't been well prepared for the application process. So a lot of investigations that one might think should have been done sooner haven't been. 
Uh, so parties are struggling to get all that information together. There's only so many experts out there who can do all these intrusive surveys, so on and so forth. Um, as I say, there is this day 31st December for fully costed proposals, and uh, the deadline is that works must start on the 31st of March. So it's a really short timeline that's in place. We haven't got an awful lot of stats from the government at the moment. Most recently published statistics that I can find were the 25th of September. At that point, they recorded there were 2,784 registrations. Um, about 1,600 of those are in London, 1,200 out of London. But of those, 1,700 uh, failed to give even basic information to show whether they were eligible. So I think a lot of them were sort of applications made just in case because of the deadline. Um, of those 2,784, as at the 25th of September, only 65 were ready to proceed with a full application and 73 had been dismissed as clearly ineligible. Now, lots of progress has definitely been made since then. I, I know of uh, a good number of buildings who've now been allocated funding, admittedly, mostly in the last uh, few weeks. So the money is getting out there and also funding for pre-work surveys and, um, and that sort of thing, pre-tender support funding, they call it, have, have, have progressed. So what are the issues, oh, sorry, about this slide. This is the general process that has to be followed. You, you can see why it takes so long. There's all these stages and you slowly make your way through the system. What are the difficulties that are coming up? Well, one difficulty has been known from the outset, which is the fund's not going to cover mitigating measures. So it's not going to cover, uh, for example, the cost of a, a waking watch for people sort of wandering up and down the building. That's a notable omission because uh, the cost of that can be tens of thousands every month. I've even seen a case where it was over a hundred thousand pounds a month just for the waking watch. There's no funding for that. So there's still significant sums for these holders to, to find. You have some blocks that have a mixture of ACM cladding and non-ACM, but still combustible cladding. And in those cases, you've got to apply under the two different funds. You've got to apply both to the BSF and to the ACM fund. And your applications will then be assessed by two different teams with slightly varying criteria, potentially divergent views, and with duplication of work between them, which seems to me a bit crackers, but that's how it's working. The state aid requirements, it's a bit more a sort of practical issue, but getting replies from uh, particularly overseas investors can be pretty time consuming and, and slow. Ultimately, you're not going to get funding for a portion of your works if you can't satisfy the state aid um, requirements. Um, now, of course, the answer to that is going to be at the leaseholders who failed to reply and provide the state aid information are probably the ones that are going to lose out, but it, it's nonetheless a bit of a headache. I've really meant timescales. 31st of December is really tight. I mean, plainly particularly at this point, it's only a few weeks away. But if you've only been notified of the funding, say last week or the week before that, you've um, you know, you've got to commit to these works such that a contractor is on site, takes possession of the site and has actually started work by the 31st of March. And for those that are still working their way through the application process, they need their tender returns by the 31st of December as things stand. Now, um, that's really difficult in part because until you know how much funding you're going to get, you may not know precisely what the scope of the work you're going to undertake is. Because if you're told, well, we're not going to fund X, Y, and Z, you might try to find more ways of procuring that where you're not constrained by the 31st of March deadline. So there's lots of different um, things in play that makes this quite difficult. Now with the 31st of March deadline, potentially there's going to be a huge number of sites up and down the country where contractors come onto site and put some fencing up and maybe a bit of a sort of crash deck over the entrance and say, right, we've started, and then essentially mothball it because there are not enough contractors to get all this work done. So there's some real timeline issues, essentially. Uh, I've heard of issues with funding agreements, not going to go into that now, but they're, they're essentially said to be non-negotiable. They're drafted from a financial point of view rather than the property leasehold focus. And as I understand, there's circumstances in which you might have to repay the money down the line, which could cause some difficulties. The fund is insufficient. As I say, a billion's never going to be enough. Uh, I understand from a, a 
good source that I spoke to yesterday that the funding has pretty much now all been allocated. That may or may not be right. So don't panic, those of you who are still waiting, but that, that is the, uh, the rumor that I hear. Um, and it seems relatively clear that the government's not going to extend it, but, but who knows. Uh, the other issue is, of course, that there's only so many contractors, so uh, that's causing real difficult, difficulties for the progression of the works and the progression of applications. What's coming on the horizon? Well, here we go. This is the um, Barris, the crystal ball section. Um, the government's pretty insistent that funding is not going to be extended, but as I say, who knows? But it does seem that a large number of developments are not going to be funded. That seems a likely outcome. Uh, it seems to me it's possible there'll be some kind of alternative uh, for which you can read less generous scheme. Uh, possibly one that's aimed not just at cladding, but also dealing with some of the internal compartation issues. And this will obviously dovetail with what Justin's going on to look at in a minute as to how it all might work. But it seems to me some kind of loan scheme so as to forward fund works is the most likely, uh, the most likely alternative scheme. As to extension of current deadlines, I, I understand um, from several sources that an extension of the 31st of December deadline might well be forthcoming in the next week or two. The government's tending to keep all these deadlines and any extensions up its sleeve until the last minute so as to force people not to take their foot off the gas to keep pushing these applications through. So uh, I suspect if there is an extension, it'll be it'll be announced really as close to the time as they can. Um, I think the 31st of March deadline might also get moves, but we'll see. Ultimately, all of this is all very political. The government's got statistics that it's publishing showing how many blocks still need remediation and they're keen to be able to move things from no plans in place to plans in place to works have started to you know buildings are done so it's all about sort of progressing the government giant spreadsheets on building safety um it's all political it could all change i think any changes will be last minute i think there will be an announcement as to whether or not the funding has all been allocated or if not to what extent any remains fairly soon but if it's bad news one does wonder on what date they will reveal this information, perhaps the uh, date of a Brexit deal or not a Brexit deal so they can bury their news. We shall see. And of course, the other thing to note is with Brexit, state aid rules could change after the 31st December. That might ease the process, it might not. We'll see. So the last thing I want to touch on is just some of the practical ramifications uh, once you get your outcome under the, under the fund. Of course, the first question is what what happens if you don't get funding? Um, it seems to me uh, it's obvious that on some developments there's going to be real difficulties in funding the works. That was true before the BSF was announced. That's that's nothing new. Uh, but particularly in RTM or RMC situations where there isn't anyone to forward fund the works, and you need to get leaseholders getting all the money together before you can commit to a contractor to show you've got the money. You can end up with sort of real paralysis in those cases and, and we're going to reach the crisis point in, in some examples unfortunately i think but of course the more interesting from a lawyer's point of view argument is well let's say that a landlord fails to get funding because they didn't get their application in at all or they got the application in but didn't have sufficient information to progress the application and ultimately because of the first come first served basis they don't get funding is it open to leaseholders to say, well, actually, I'm not going to pay this bill for the cladding because these costs haven't been reasonably incurred because had you essentially got your arse in gear, you'd have actually got your application in and we'd have got funding. So I think those arguments are bound to play out in some examples. Quite how a leaseholder would prove that their landlord would have got uh, funding had they applied sooner or provided information sooner. I doubt, and will the tribunal deal with it on a loss of a chance basis or on a balance of probabilities basis? All of this to be worked out, but those arguments uh, are undoubtedly going to come. What if you get the funding? Well, at that point, as I understand it, uh, you're going to run the project as if you didn't have funding. So uh, by that, I mean the cost of, the full cost of the project is going to be shown in your service charge accounts. 
the Section 20 requirements are going to have to be met or dispensed with. You can't avoid Section 20 just on the basis that the BSF funding should cover the whole of the cost of the project. Um, you're going to have to think about things like Section 20B. If the works span several service charge year, you can't get your service charge final account sort of sorted within 18 months. So how do you use the BSF funding? Well, the answer is once you get to the end of the project or, or indeed as against uh, interim uh, bills, the BSF funds are then credited against the individual leaseholder bills. That's how you deal with, for example, ineligible leaseholders uh, who, for example, for state aid reasons, are not entitled to BSF funding. They won't get that credit, whereas the others will. It's, it's a credit against the bills. Now, um, given the need to consult, uh, it's probably worth just reminding ourselves of a couple of things on the consultation. Um, you've got to consult if the uh, qualifying works are going to cost more than £250 for any one leaseholder in the block, or if it's qualifying long-term agreement, an agreement that must last more than 12 months. It seems to me there's unlikely to be any QRTA issues on these, these cladding works. Um, in terms of the qualifying works, plainly the cladding works are going to cost more than £250 and they're qualifying works. One issue that's been coming up is whether you need to consult for pre-work surveys. Uh, now, there's no direct authority on the current version of Section 20 on this point. My clear view is you don't need to consult for pre-work surveys uh, because they are not works to a building. They don't trigger the consultation requirement. Um, it may be that views differ, but I certainly I haven't seen any contrary view to that. As, as I say, there's no authority on it. It's not guaranteed, but I think it's reasonably uh, reasonably well settled that you don't need to consult for those pre-work surveys. But as to the works, you've got to, and compliance with Section 20 is going to be near impossible uh, with an awful lot of these cases. You've got your two 30-day consultation periods. Uh, you've got the need to uh, tender all the works in circumstances where the only way of getting these works done by 31st of March is on sort of design and build contracts where you're getting involved much earlier in the process. Um, I think in most instances, dispensation will need to be sought. So that's obviously section 20 uh, ZA. Um, but one very real practical reason is that once you get funding, you're probably going to want to sign that contract really quickly with a contractor that can commit to the 31st of March deadline. And that's not very compatible with uh, the full sort of consultation process. So if you've got to apply for dispensation, when should you apply? I don't suggest that those with lots of blocks ought to just apply en masse for dispensation. I think it makes sense to uh, deal with dispensation on a block by block basis to apply once you've got all the evidence available. There's no point in applying with half, half the evidence missing. So as soon as you can, but with the ability to properly evidence yeah, the, the, the dispensation. Ideally, you do it before you contract it, but that's not always going to be possible. Now, yes, you could leave it and just deal with it at recovery stage, but I think that's more likely to result in a contested application. It's more likely to cost more and potentially the tribunal is going to impose more conditions uh, on the grant of dispensation. I think you'll get dispensation in most cases, but the question is what conditions are imposed upon it. The reality is leaseholders are going to be able to show more prejudice. Um, which is, of course, the test on the Deja and events. And they're going to be able to show more prejudice further into the works you get because there might be costs overruns, there might be changes in specifications, so on and so forth. You're better off doing it at an earlier, earlier stage. Um, the best thing, best approach from a management perspective, make sure that you do informal consultation as far as you can, a sort of extra statutory consultation, even if you have to really shorten time periods, if you have to do stuff by email. And communication is key. I mean, this is true in pretty much every leasehold context. There's an awful lot of disputes can be resolved by just making sure there's good communication between the managers and um, the building managers and the leaseholders so everyone knows what's going on, because that clears up an awful lot of um, doubts and, um, you know, can sort of really build, build support. There's no reason why these dispensation applications need to be contested i think they're fairly straightforward as long as you explain yourself and keep these soldiers on board i think that's all i wanted to cover so i'll hand over to justin <laughs>
Right. So, yeah, I'm working there now. So, um, what's Parliament been up to then? Can I? There we go. There's there's two bits of legislation, well, one draft bit of legislation and one bit of real legislation that are knocking around at the moment that I think we need to know about in terms of what's coming next and in terms of the, the issues that there will be down the line with Blue Fire Safety Works. And I want to talk about them both. I want to start with the Draft Building Safety Bill, um, which although it's only at draft stage at the moment, is clearly, clearly represents the, govern the government's present view as to how to deal with the ongoing crisis of unsafe uh, buildings in England and Wales. And I want to start with that one because we've had the Communities and Local Government Select Committee report on the bill. There's been a lot of published evidence about the bill, some 300 odd pieces of evidence have been published. And uh, as is the way with this government, we've had press, le press leaks about what they're going to do um, by the Sunday Times last weekend. And then I want to talk a little bit about the fire safety bill. Uh, that's presently what's called a ping pong stage. So there have been some amendments made by the House of Lords that the House of Commons hasn't voted on. The House of Commons has to decide whether to accept or reject those amendments or propose something else. And there's a, quite an interesting fight brewing in the fire safety bill about the question of who pays for remedial works in respect of unsafe cladding and associated fire safety defects. So let's start with the building safety bill. Published in draft form in July 2020. So this hasn't even got onto the, the floor of Parliament yet for first reading. This has effectively been a, con a consultation on a draft bill. And it does an awful lot, the Building Safety Bill. The, the main, the, the, one of the main things it does is set up a new regulatory regime for higher risk buildings. Um, I'm not going to talk an awful lot about that because the details are quite vague. A lot of the information about what counts as a higher risk building, for example, will come in secondary legislation rather than on the face of the, of the bill as it stands. I want to talk about clauses 88 and 89 of the draft bill, because these are the bits that are attracted the most adverse comment, and they are the bits that represent the, go the government's current solution to the current problem of unsafe cladding and associated fire safety problems. The way clauses 88 and 89 work is that they, they will change the, the Land Lord and Tenant Act 1985 and they will create a new section 17A through to about 17Y. And what they will do is they will create a new implied term, which is implied into all residential leases, regardless of when they were granted, that the landlord, well, actually, they can, actually the relevant person, but the landlord or the management company, as the case may be, the person who looks after the fabric of the building, that that, that person will have to carry out all the relevant safety works that are required by the building safety bill. And as a flip side of that, the leaseholders will have to pay for those costs, the cost of those works, and have to pay them within 28 days of a demand being made. And the way it does that is, in, is to, in effect, create a parallel service charge regime including a new reasonableness provision, which is effectively lifted from section 19, a new consultation provision, a new time limit provision, which is effectively 20B. In effect, it is a parallel service charge regime. Now, the reason this has attracted so much attention is this is the, the, the way, if this bill were passed, this is the way that buildings that have not managed to remedy their fire safety defects because they haven't got the money from the fund, because they didn't qualify or because there wasn't enough money in it. This is how you will make buildings safe over the next few years. This is how you pay, for, you enforce the requirement to fix cladding and how you pay for it. The way it will work is that the regulator will, will say hazardous cladding is covered by the uh, safety works required by this bill. The landlord therefore has to fix the, the uh, flammable cladding problems and he will be entitled to make the tenants pay through this new parallel service charge regime. And this isn't just me extrapolating sort of from a worst case scenario, that the government, um, although they're slightly rowing back a bit now, but their, their public position has been, that's the purpose of this. This is the scheme by which you make buildings safe. And we know that because they've said one of the reasons they want to create this new parallel regime governed by statute is that you can't be sure that, in, that each lease of a flat in an affected building 
will provide for the work to be done or for the costs to be recovered. So what they're going to do is bypass the individual positions under individual leases and just create statutory duties to do this work and statutory duties to pay. So they solve the, cl the cladding crisis by creating new duties on landlords and most importantly, by creating a new duty on the leaseholders to pay for these costs. You can all imagine that this has led to a fair bit of controversy. Um, the Communities and Local Government Select Committee held an inquiry into this draft bill, um, part of their pre-legislative scrutiny stage. There were 326 submissions to the inquiry, um, almost all of which were deeply critical of the new charging regime. And then there were five days of oral evidence about it as well. Not all of them relate to the charging regime, some of them are about the regulator. But if you want to watch some of the evidence about the, the charging regime, there's a very, um, uh, to my mind, persuasive session where a number of people uh, from across the leasehold spectrum line up just to criticise the proposals that are being made, um, criticise them as both unaffordable on the part of leaseholders, criticise them as happenstantial, because there's no point creating an obligation to pay if someone can't pay, um, and criticise them in terms of the additional management costs that will come with creating a brand new a brand new service charge regime to run parallel to your contractual service charge regime. Um, also, if you, you feel like having a, a slightly dark humoured laugh, you can watch the performance of the minister because it's appalling. Um, and his response to every difficult question is little more than, I don't know, I've only just been appointed. Um, the CLG Select Committee have published their report on the draft bill, uh, published on the 24th of November. They note that the new charging system is almost universally hated. Um, leaseholders think it's unfair. They have to pay for their fire safety defects where those fire safety defects predate the ownership of the lease. And for any of you who've been following the evidence over the last 10 days or so from the grandfather inquiry, um, you may well have some sympathy for that view because the evidence that's come out over the last 10 days or so shows there has been at the lowest misleading marketing practices from a number of the cladding companies, at worst, something significantly worse than misleading. Um, and you will also have seen that there is a very, very open question on the government's culpability uh, in terms of not changing uh, approved document B, which is the fire safety parts, or in terms of not taking steps to deal with what they were told about misleading practices in the market. Um, the government's culpability won't be examined until module six in the inquiry, so a little bit later on. But uh, over the last 10 days, it has become clear that there are a lot of very difficult questions for the industry and for the government to answer. And you might well think it is unfair for occupiers to have to pay for the costs arising out of market and regulatory failure. But it's not just leaseholders who hated it. The local government association described the reforms as the greatest shortcoming in the bill, despite the fact the local government association's members would benefit enormously from these reforms. The local government association's members are, as you might imagine, local authorities. And the long leases that local authorities have granted are almost without exception all right to buy leases under the Housing Act 1980 or the, now the 1985 Act. Those leases aren't great on service charge recovery um, for a number of reasons we don't need to go into. But as a broad rule, local authority leases don't, don't provide for as generous a recovery as private sector leases. So local authorities, would, you would think, would be quite happy to have these powers to recover because otherwise they're likely to have to do works that they can't, re that they can't recover under the terms of their leases. But the local government association simply does not see that this is a fair uh, divide. And they make the point, which seems to me to be quite an important point, that you can create a legal obligation on the leaseholder to pay. If they simply don't have the money, what are you proposing to do? Are you really proposing that the landlord forfeits the flat and takes it back? Because you, you have to have, if you're going to have a system whereby the cost of the remedial work is dependent upon the leaseholders paying for it, you have to have a system whereby all, or possibly all, all but a tiny percentage, is recovered from those leaseholders. To put it bluntly, you can't procure 90% of a cladding system. So if 10% of the leaseholders can't pay and the freeholder has no money, the building isn't going to be made safer, regardless of what the Act says. Um, the, gov the, com the committee also notes that there's been quite a significant shift in government rhetoric over the last few months on this. 
um, it notes that ministers, indeed the Prime Minister, um, both the current and former one, have stood at the dispatch box and said that leaseholders should not have to pay at all, and has now no and has noticed that recently the shift has been to not having to pay unaffordable sums. Uh, and the committee is quite critical of that, because the question, of course, then becomes what is unaffordable? And the reality is, if you're going to have a scheme whereby tens of thousands of pounds of remedial works have to be paid by the leaseholders, what is unaffordable for that building is governed by the finances of the least well-off leaseholder in that building. Because if one person can't pay, you can't procure the system. So what does the report conclude? Well, if I have kind of a big ask and a little ask, the big ask are the two first, the first two points under, under the second bullet point. They say the government should just come out and say that leaseholders do not have to pay for fire safety costs, and the way they should deal with this is the government should provide the initial funding and then should look at ways of recovering it from developers in due course. And they suggest, for example, the model that's being used in New South Wales. Their small ask is that if you are going to go down this route, you've got to create significantly longer than 28 days to pay. Um, I imagine the government will give ground on that small ask, but the small ask doesn't really deal with the structural problems that this bill is going to create. Where are we in terms of the draft safety bill? Um, it's not been introduced to Parliament yet, so the government's got time to consider whether they want to change, and I know that there are discussions internally in government as to what they could change. There's significant cross-party support for changes to the idea that leaseholders have to pay. Whether it's enough to vote down or, or to get an amendment through, I don't know. But there's significant Tory backbench support and there's significant Labour support um, to provide that leaseholders shouldn't have to pay. Uh, the government seem to be quite surprised by the degree of criticism that their proposals have faced. Um, I, I suspect that is because these reforms have been dealt with from a building safety perspective rather than from a leasehold perspective. Um, and I wonder whether the government would not benefit from having slightly more leaseholder input, lease, with leaseholder as in occupiers and leaseholders as in experts in leasehold field, in, uh, putting their proposals in, forward. The, the leak at the weekend from the Sunday Times was interesting. Um, so the Sunday Times suggested that the government's compromise is going to be to offer 30 year loans to leaseholders at 2% interest to help the leaseholders pay for these costs under the building safety bill. Um, that's a difficult one, it seems to me. It, it is a solution to a, a short-term problem because it means that, some, that someone other than the leaseholder stumps up the immediate cost of these fire safety works. And it should mean that for buildings who don't benefit from the BSF or who don't find some other way of funding it, either under warranties or similar, it should mean that there is money into the system to try and get things done. Having said that, that's still a significant personal burden for a leaseholder to take on. It does mean that we're looking at certainly hundreds of thousands, probably millions of people whose equity in their properties effectively vanishes, which will make it more difficult for them to move on in the housing ladder and means you might find people who are stuck in flats for longer than they might want to be. Um, any of you who follow some of this stuff on Twitter will see that the, the, the scenario of a young couple who want to move out because they want space for their kids is a far from uncommon one. And if there's no equity in the flat, so they can't use the equity to fund the deposit for the new property, the reality is they're stuck in the flat. It, it's a better solution than simply saying pay within 28 days, but it's not a it's not the perfect solution. It does mean that individuals will still end up shouldering the burden of a marketing and regulatory reform. Let's see what the government comes back with, but that looks like being the, the, reform, the reform proposal at the moment. Um, the fire safety bill has made significantly more progress than the building safety bill. This one has actually made its way through both House Commons and the House of Lords. And it does two things. That the first set of reforms it brings through is relatively uncontroversial. So what it's going to do is amend the, the regulatory reform fire safety order so that cladding falls within the scope of the 2005 order, because at the moment cladding doesn't. At the moment, um, 
you can't say that cladding is a common part of a building because the common parts clauses of the order are defined by reference to things that you use in common and you don't really use cladding in common. And certainly the government's view is that cladding safety should be dealt with under the housing health and safety rating system of the Housing Act 2004. So enforced by local authorities, not forced by the fire brigade. Um, they want to move it to become a fire brigade matter and that's one way of doing it and that seems to me to be relatively sensible. The other thing it does is it changes the definition uh, in, respect of, in respect of the excluded dwellings so that the external face of the front door of a flat becomes the regulatory reform responsibility of the uh, effectively the landlord. So there's a problem at the moment, as I'm sure you all know, that the individual flat is excluded from the regulatory reform order. So what do you do if the front door of the flat is demised to the leaseholder and so it's excluded, but the front door of the flat forms part of the fire safety protection of the common parts because you need the entirety of the corridor to be fire safe. And if the, if the front door of the flat is not does not meet fire safety standards, what do you do about it? And there's a, a case, a pre grandfather case called Southwark and St Saviour's Estate where the London Borough of Southwark get themselves into a real mess about this. Because the problem is that if you're, if it's been demised, then chances are your only power under the lease to require the leaseholders to do something about it depends upon it being in disrepair. And these, these doors aren't in disrepair, they just don't meet regulatory standards. So those reforms seem to be relatively uncontroversial and they'll be about improving the fire safety position of the building as a whole. The more controversial reform is this, which was added in the House of Lords with a massive majority. Um, a Lib Dem peer proposed and got through that amendment that I've got there in italics. Now, what that amendment is designed to do is to prevent the cladding safety works being charged back to leaseholders. But there's a couple of problems with that amendment that you can see immediately. The first is that it applies to any remedial work attributable to the provisions of the Act. So it's going to exclude um, simple day-to-day -day repairs, whereas what they, what they want to do is simply exclude the, the cladding safety works. Um, secondly, it doesn't really provide an answer to the problem of what do you do where the leaseholders are the freeholder by another means? Because subsection two just says, well, that doesn't, it doesn't affect it. So it doesn't grapple with the affordability issue. That um, reform, that amendment, is at what's called ping pong stage now. So the House of Commons will have to vote on that amendment. The government will almost certainly try and take that amendment out um, for two reasons. One, that is not their policy, that people should not have to pay. We've seen what their policy is. It's in the Building Safety Bill. Um, secondly, it's not a very good amendment. It's too broad. It does prevent cover recovery of routine expenditure, etc. Um, it is almost certain that MPs will propose an alternative amendment. Um, I am aware of a number of different drafts that are circulating, um, prepared, prepared by both Tory and Labour and Lib Dem uh, MPs. So it seems to me almost inevitable there's going to be an attempt by uh, MPs to amend the Lord's Amendment so as to try and create something that achieves the same purpose, but without the flaws. We don't know what, what stage those have got to. In particular, there's no, there's no date yet set for the ping pong stage. Um, I suspect the government will defeat the amendments. The interesting thing to watch will be the strength of the uh, vote and the rebellion as it, may, as it will be by Tory backbenchers against it. Because I imagine MPs will use the fire safety bill to put down a marker about what their, their views are as to what's acceptable in the building safety bill. That will be um, possibly this year, that debate. Um, it hasn't been announced yet for a date, certainly early next year. That's the one to keep an eye out for because that will give you an indication as to what, the gov if the government's going to climb down, they will say something in debate that they will use to justify uh, removing the amendments. If they're not going to climb down, then watch for the size of the rebellion and see whether there might be scope for a form of building safety bill when it comes through. Um, that takes us to 11.45, which is uh, the end of this webinar. We do, however, have lots of questions. Simon, you've got to dash, haven't you? Because you really do I've, have to get to court. I've got to dash. Uh, so I've answered some of the questions on the Q&A, so you'll find them in the Q&A section. Um, so I've done my best to answer a few of the ones on my section. 
Someone asked, does the uh, building safety fund cover missing fire breaks? The answer is yes, uh, it covers the whole of the cladding system. So insulation, membranes, cavity barriers, sealants, fixings, everything's through the cladding. Uh, someone asked, how does the building safety fund deal with inflated contractors prices, knowing there's limited contractors? Uh, well, the answer there is that the people administering the building safety fund have a pretty clear handle on the market price for these works. They probably have a better idea than anyone else. So they can benchmark the costs that uh, applicants are getting. Uh, but sure, there's no bargains to be had. Demand outstrips supply. Um, I, I read recently that with the current capacity in the country, it would take 10 years to deal with all the defective cladding on all the blocks if you include the low-rise blocks. So it's not all going to be sorted on 31st of March. And with that, I'm going to leave you in the capable hands of Justin and run down to mayors in the city. Uh, so thank you all for coming and uh, I'll leave you with Justin. Cheers, Simon. Thank you very much. Right, I'll, I'll, I'll hang around then for another, another couple of minutes. Let's try and pick up a few of these. Um, the, the building safety build, clauses 80 and 89, do they also relate to, relate to commercial leases? Not at the moment, no. Um, they're only relating to residential leases. Um, there's quite a, a, a long definition as to what counts as a residential lease for these purposes. Um, sh the one that strikes me as particularly unfair is shared ownership leases. Um, are going to be treated as shared as, as long leases and you have to pay 100% of the costs as a, as a shared ownership leaseholder even if you only quote unquote own 25% of your lease. Um, so it's not a commercial property problem, this is a resi property a problem. Um, what have I forgot? We've had questions about getting dead, getting works on site by March 2021. Is that realistic in the current, given the current capacity in the industry? I think Simon's touched on that already. Um, it might be realistic to get something done, but it isn't realistic to get every single building started um, and progressing by the same time. I can see there be, as he said, I can see there being a lot of going on site, sticking a, sticking a spade in the ground and then putting tarpaulin up and saying we've started. Um, as a landlord in the private rented sector, is there anything in the fire safety bill I should be looking at? Or is the bill outside the scope of the PRS? No, the fire safety bill will have quite a lot of impact on the um, there's a couple of things to think about if you're a normal PRS landlord. Um, the fire safety bill will change how the regulatory reform order works. That shouldn't be a massive problem for you, that's true. The thing that's more interesting, I think, if you're a general private sector landlord, in the building safety bill, there are, there are two things you might want to pay attention to. One is it's going to create a new right of access for landlords to go into their properties, whether tenanted or long leaseholder. Um, in order to do certain fire safety checks. And it's quite a complicated right of access to do with serving various notices saying why you want to go in and what you want to do. The other bit that's quite interesting in the, in the building safety bill is there's going to be a new duty on occupiers, so the tenants, um, the AST tenant, for example, in respect of the safety of their appliances. Um, there's quite a lot of detail to be worked out in that still, but that looks to me like quite an interesting one. Um, I can see that having quite a few knock-on implications in terms of electrical safety testing, in terms possibly of landlord's insurance for, for rented properties. So that one needs, needs to have an, uh, an eye kept on it. Um, any views on the applicability of the 2014 mandatory reduction directions to BSF works, where the social landlord only obtains funding for certain elements, but not others? Um, The mandatory directions aren't going to matter, are they? Because as I understand the funding arrangements, it's a condition of your funding arrangement that you have to give credit for what you've received and you accredit it to the individual leaseholders' accounts. Are you worried about whether the mandatory directions are overbroad? So is the problem that if you receive any funding, the mandatory directions might require and in, might require a social landlord to absorb all the rest of the costs. And if that is your worry, I'd have to go and read the mandatory directions again, because I can't remember what they say off the top of my head. Um, will the slides be circulated after the webinar? Yes, that's a really easy one to answer. There will be a, uh, an email with a link to the recording of this, and the, in that recording there will be a link to uh, the slides. Um, what about a levy suggestion? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have a lot of sympathy for uh, levies on developers. Um, that's one of the models that's been used in Australia. I mean, look, the, the, 
that might turn this into a bit of a, a, bit of a rant of, of my own views on these things. But we are not the only country in the world that has a problem with flammable cladding and, and unsafe buildings. There are lots of countries, including countries with quite similar legal and cultural systems to ours, that have the same problem. The most obvious one is Australia, where they have a massive problem with flammable cladding um, and unsafe buildings. Uh, I've seen one suggesting that Melbourne alone has 2,000 buildings that fail, fail their fire safety, fire safety standards. Um, and Australia's got various different schemes because it's a, a federal country, different states in Australia are dealing with it in different ways. But a, a, a levy system on developers for future house building is one they've tried. Um, there's another one they've tried where the government is just funding everything and in exchange for which everyone is required to assign their, their damages claims, if any, to the government and the government will proceed in due course. Um, there are lots of ways of doing this that don't involve the leaseholders paying. Australia's trialling about six different models. Go and look at what Australia is doing. Um, their system is similar enough to ours that you could learn quite a lot from that. Um, the idea that the leaseholder pays is, frankly, if you're a policymaker, it's the root of it's, it's the root of least resistance, but it's not a very sensible one. I just don't think it will work. Um, if the landlord misses the deadline for applying to the BSF, will that affect its ability to recharge service charges? Mm, don't know. I, mean, I agree with what Simon said on this. You can see the argument. You can see the argument that the cost isn't reasonably incurred because there was an opportunity for you to apply to the BSF. But how do you value that? In professional negligence terms, you'd have to value it as loss of a chance. So what was your chance of succeeding to the, to the BSF and what funding would you have received? That's your loss. You lost a 10% chance of receiving £20,000. Or do you just do it as, the as I suspect the tribunal will be inclined to, just do it on a straight, no, it's not reasonably incurred. You didn't apply. So that's the end of it. But that is a question that is easily capable of going to the Court of Appeal. Um, and I don't, sus I don't suspect there is an easy answer to it. Uh, what about a few more questions? Can I explain the differences in funding for private and social sector? No, um, I don't really understand why, the, why a distinction was drawn between the two different funds. Um, I'm sure there is some reason, I just don't know what it is. Um, if the House of Lords or similar amend, amendment to the Fire Safety Bill passes, is it likely that the costs of remediating under 18 metre blocks would not be recoverable? Yes. So the point of the amendment that the Lib Dem peer introduced in the House of Lords is to stop any leaseholder of any building anywhere in England or Wales having to pay for fire safety works. Um, the drafting doesn't work because it doesn't exclude uh, ongoing legitimate costs. So it would exclude, for example, the cost of the annual servicing of the um, of the sprinklers, let's say. And that's why the amendment doesn't work. It's too generous. The amendment, the amendments that are being that are going that are going to be proposed in the Commons, the drafts of them that I have seen, are all targeted at dealing with cladding and associated remediation works, regardless of the height of the building. And that is what I think the debate will be when it finally comes back. I think that's probably most of these questions covered. Um, there's a handful of questions that I'm not going to answer because the question itself is defamatory and I am not prepared to be sued by the companies that are named. Um, and there are uh, some questions that are very, very uh, specific to individual buildings. And again, I'm not prepared to be sued, so I'm not going to answer those. Um, I will probably wrap this up here unless there are any further questions. In the next day or so, you will get a link to this webinar um, and you can watch it again uh, as you wish over your own, uh, in your own free time. And when you get that link, the slides will also be, uh, details of how to get the slides will be included within that link. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for your time. I hope that was useful uh, and uh, have a nice rest of your day. Thank you very much.